My name is John and I'm at Paint School on Instagram. I've done over $15 million in paint jobs and I'm based out of Huntington Beach, California. Aaron is at Alpha Painting on Instagram. He's managed huge commercial projects with impossible timelines and has a few years into building his own operation out of Branson, Missouri. And you should probably check out our full process videos on YouTube because they're pretty badass. Our point in doing this podcast is to put our 40 plus years of combined experience to the test. We've seen a decline in the industry. And while I think it's a bit arrogant to think we can change it, we're giving it a shot. Listen up and let us know what you think. This is Paint Sniffer Podcast. Okay, so I've got this Alder project that we're working on right now. Um, it's only like six or seven interior doors and then all the baseboards, all the jams um, and window casings. And so the contractor just dropped off like, I don't know, 300 linear feet of one by fours basically. So we have to go through and <clears throat> like pick out the good sides and the bad sides and then stain and finish them. But we're using a water-based clear. Um, what do you think about the water-based clear coats? It's all going to be interior. Um, we're probably going to use general finishes on this. Um, their product is actually exterior rated. But I think that's what we're going to go with. Uh, what do you what do you think about the water based clears these days? I I don't use much, uh, really, man. I all I can think about, like off the top of my head, um, I mean, we're primarily lacquer. We're, I'm still, you know, vinyl sealer, pre cat lacquer on a lot of stuff. Um, I had like several months ago done a set of cabinets um, where I couldn't shoot lacquer, and I I did poly acrylic on them. Um, and I don't think that's really preferred, but that shit does. The only reason I feel that it would be viable on something like that is because I've, you know, used it quite a bit and it does dry super hard. Um, yeah. I've, I've put polyacrylic on like a table mm -hmm. um, over paint and shit just to protect like a faux, you know, some yeah. little like household project and then didn't give a shit about the table anymore and then threw it outside on the front porch and it sat there for four years and never oxidized. So yeah, I feel, I feel it's, it's pretty viable if you're brushing stuff inside. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't really do a lot of shit like that. So, yeah, um, I'm not really the guy to ask on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This stuff's pretty good. I've used it, um, on quite a few projects and it dries hard. You know, when you put it on, it's like you can't go too heavy or it's running all over the place. You know, we've done it on um, entry doors. Um, and I did it. We have a place in Big Bear and we put some live edge, um, I don't know, like bar tops on the outdoor patio. And I finished those with this this uh, general finishes. I think it's 450 is the product line. Exterior water-based clear coat. Um, and pretty harsh elements. So we'll see how long it lasts. It's going to be yeah. a good test. See if it falls apart in one year or not. I'm using like with like my feature door restoration, I'm using F fans right now, but, um, what are you using on it? F fans. Oh yeah. That's a good product. Um, I can't, I can't ever remember the name of the water-based spar urethane that I, that I use like outdoors. Mm -hmm. Um, Sherwin gets it. They have to outsource it, but I can never remember the fucking name of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not even going to go into it, but, um, yeah, dude, I'm not, uh, it's pretty much vinyl sealer pre-cat lacquer inside for me if we're ever into any clears. Yeah. Yeah. Can't go wrong with it. All right. So we got an email in, um, this guy's asking regrets or things you would have done differently in the beginning stages of business. Uh, and then transition from working all the time to becoming the boss and leaving responsible ones in charge. Do you have any regrets? So you're a few years in on your own company right now, right? Yeah. Do you have any regrets so far? I mean, I'm sure we all do, but. I think my situation's unique. Um, you know, like a lot you of. You got to move up to the mic a little bit. A lot of people. Um, 
I think a lot of people go into business for themselves early and then they struggle and yeah. stuff. So mm -hmm. I think personally, I went into business for myself like extremely late. Um, I did do about two years um, in business for myself. Shit, like I think around 20, 2015, I think it was mm -hmm. 2014. And I ended up, you know, slowing down and, and going back to work for a large commercial contractor and kind of just restructuring his company. But, um, I'm all in on this now. Um, I think you're more the guy to talk to about that kind of shit. Like I can, I can talk about, you know, field logistics and training guys and stuff like that. But in terms of the business side, man, I'm still, I have a lot of shit to learn, but, yeah. um, I don't, I don't know about any regrets, man. I just, uh, I decided I was going to do it and I haven't stopped and I've kind of tried my best to build a machine and it keeps working. So, um, you know, I haven't sat at the house a single day since I started. So yeah, that's all I mean, we can get into, into stuff that I do or whatever, but, um, I'm really not the guy to, ask about that just because I had a lot of field experience prior to doing it. So I already had my vision, you know, I knew what yeah. I was going to do. Yeah. I think it's a big difference for most companies nowadays. Uh, they're starting really quickly, you know, and, and I started relatively quickly. Um, I was about five years in when I started working for myself. Um, but when I started, I was a one man shop for boy, three or four years, just doing small jobs only. You yeah. know, I would do like one bedroom, three doors, um, fascia boards only, um, you know, gates, a fence, like all small jobs. And there was a lot of business uh, in that range because any of the big, like reputable companies wouldn't even touch it, you know, or they have minimums. Right. Yeah. Um, and so for me, like I had the dream life for a while, you know, like I go paint one bedroom, make 300 bucks and a half a day and take the rest of the day off. You know, yeah. I was like living it up, you know, I was like 20, 22 or something like that. 23. Yeah. And have the time of my life, man. <laughs> I think now if you try and do that shit, dude, it, the, it's not worth it. Like if you pull footage right on a bathroom, like you're going to come out in the negative. Yeah. Just cause it's a small <laughs> room, you know, it's not even going to cover your cost of paint. Yeah. Well, and that's a problem for me now is now I can't do those jobs because I can't make any money on it, you know, because I'm having, I'm sending guys to go do the work, you know, yeah. and I'm paying my estimator a commission to go look at that job. And so we have to have minimums. Um, and I get inquiries all the time about like, Hey, I have one bathroom that needs to be painted, you know, and I'll tell them, Hey, our minimum is 600 bucks. Um, you know, if you shop around, you can find somebody that'll do it for like two or 300, you know, and usually yeah. they'll go that route every now and then they're like, Oh, well, we heard a lot of good things. We'd like you to do it. Can we add in a couple doors or something, you know? Yeah. The, the first couple of years I did it, um, you know, I did the thing where, yeah, I'd go, you know, do a small repaint or paint a bedroom or a bathroom. And I kind of bounced around doing that for a couple of years. And then I'd go fill in with like a buddy of mine that had his own business. Um, this time around though, dude, I, you know, right off the bat, like, I think I did some, a couple small jobs and then boom, you know, I'm like, I'm, I just, I'm going all in. I ended up getting a 60 unit, um, motel. Um, and I turned it in 40 days with my son, just sanding door jams and putting door jams. I did everything else, but, um, and then that got the wheel spinning. So once, you know, I got my first draw, then I finance a gas pump and then I finance this and mm -hmm. that got the wheel spinning enough for me to where I was just, you know, I was going right from the start. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice if you can get some big projects in there, but it's, that's daunting too. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't have even looked at a project like that when I was starting out. Yeah. You know, well, I'm mean, just been... a small, you know, the 60 rooms you're talking, uh, you know, an open room that's, you know, I don't, I don't remember what it was like, you know, 12 by 15 or whatever it would have been. And then a bathroom. 
So yeah, but that's I because had, of your experience, though. Like, that's yeah. just 60 rooms. There's no way I would have touched that. It would have been too overwhelming to me, you know? Yeah. Just because, for me, I would think, like, fuck, I'm going to take forever to do this project. They're going to be unhappy with me halfway through because I'm taking so long. Um, but that's probably all your background. You know exactly what that project looks like, you know, timeline-wise and all that stuff. Yeah. No, once, once I was, dude, I think I... Like I shot my primer, got my primer and my ceiling paint up in like two days. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> so instantly it looks like you're making progress. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I do think most companies are getting started too early right now. Well, I say most, but I don't really know exactly. But it seems like a lot of companies right now are starting too early. You know, it's like guys are painting with one year experience and then doing their own business, you know? Yeah. Um, the, I have mixed feelings about it. On one side, it's like, hey, go for it. Um, you know, it's great to be in business for yourself. Um, on the other side, it's like, I took calculated risks when, when I started doing work for people. I didn't get in over my head uh, when I started out because I didn't want to rip anyone off. You know, I didn't want to do like a stain refinish on a front door and just hack it and charge them a thousand bucks and they're going to have to redo it in a year, you know, because I did such a shitty job or it comes out looking terrible because I don't really know what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, and I have to pay someone else to fix my mistakes. You know, I didn't want to do anything where I was like taking, taking advantage of someone else. <clears throat> and so, so with. With me, like, I mean, if you look at an apprenticeship, at like whether you can get in with a, a, you know, a union company, which in my opinion, the union is lax and bullshit in, in my area. But um, if you can have somebody, you know, apprentice you for, for four years, like cool. But realistically, man, you're going to, you know, what do you think the marker is? Like, I, I think that you still have no fucking clue what you're doing after like 10 years. You know what I mean? <laughs> There's going to be multiple points in your career where you look back, you know, uh, the 10 year marker, you look back and realize you didn't know shit five years prior. And even yeah. at the 15 and 20, you can look back and realize, fuck, man, I didn't know shit 10 years ago. You know what yeah. I mean? But, yeah, I, I think that's the case probably forever. It's probably going to be like that forever. Um, as soon as I started getting involved in like Instagram and some of these Facebook groups and stuff, maybe not Facebook, but Instagram, um, there's some people that really know their stuff. And I thought I knew my stuff pretty well. Um, but then I get into, well, even like with you, you know, we have conversations about spray equipment or different processes for finish work. Um, it's like, oh, there's a lot of shit I still don't know. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I just, I've been around it so long and I know a lot, but, um, there's plenty that I don't know still, you know, well, we're, and then we're there's always at, tricks. Yeah. We're all at different stages. So, you know what I mean? Like it, if I, I look at myself, like I'm a field guy that doesn't know a fucking thing about business and I'm making that up as I go. And you're like a business guy that, you know, has field experience, but, you know, you went in at a certain point, I would imagine going in at like the five year marker, it, you know, if that's what you did, that, that you had to do a lot of learning from your mistakes. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I still like, I'm on a job right now. I'm fucking, you know, I, I've got multiple jobs running at once, but dude, I'm, I'm at least eight grand upside down on it. You know, I'm yeah. going to figure out potentially how to make up for that. Maybe, you know, I can increase it or whatever and whatnot, but um, I don't crunch numbers like you do. Um, yeah. you know, you're, you're running off capital and, you know, running off of this big ass machine that you've built. I'm kind of going, you know, paycheck to paycheck or whatever kind of shit. But, you know, I have a lot of personal stuff that eats into my business capital that, you know, hopefully I'll be through soon. But, um, I don't know, man, like everything that I'm doing is, is basing it off of my field experience. So the mm -hmm. business stuff I'm kind of teaching myself as I go. So I'd say like, you know, with that, with the dude's first question, like regrets or things that you would have done differently in the beginning stages of business. Um, I would say fucking 
<laughs> like like IRS shit, like taxes kind of stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like learn, learn that shit. Like I should have had that shit in order before I, you know, not before I started, but I should have put more effort into that stuff because I fucking hate it. Yeah. You know, I enjoy learning the marketing and the networking and I enjoy learning bid theory because there's technically no rules to competitive bidding. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I get to kind of make that up and I get to, you know, use my own analytics and kind of study what works and what doesn't mm -hmm. and just kind of erect my own market. But, um, yeah, man, like the, the whole fucking tax thing and, you know, payroll, blah, blah, blah. Like yep. that's for a painter. That's, that's tough. And I'd imagine there's a lot of guys doing this shit that feel comfortable with that stuff, but they couldn't fucking paint their way out of a fucking wet paper bag, you know? Yep. Yeah, so. the thing is, you can be that guy who can run the business and not know how to paint. That's doable. That person can still succeed. But the painter who can't do the business side or doesn't figure out the business side at least enough to make sure you're turning a profit, make sure bills are paid on time, make sure you're not getting run over by the IRS, that person can't last forever, you know, like, or they could, they have the chance of not being able to make it, yeah. even if they paint really well you know, just because they're not taking care of legal stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's unfortunate that the person with no experience can come in and run a company and be somewhat successful at it without even knowing how to paint. Yeah. You know, well, that's, I, I mean, I've worked for a lot of those guys, man, and it, it may be, you know, fucking rainbows and shit from the outside. But once you're, you're inside of those companies and, you know, that's what I do for a living is, is train guys and shit. Yeah. You know, that's what I'd done for most of my career. And anytime you go into a company where the boss has less experience than you do, and he's some dude that took out a loan to start a business or whatever, and it's just always yeah. a fucking mess. It's always a fucking mess. And I'd always have to make the decision, well, is, you know, do I want to push these guys out that are in charge and take mm -hmm. over and, you know, yada, yada. And that was my last run, dude. I, I put in a lot of effort to get my foot in the door and work my way up and, you know, kind of, you know, be a director of field operations. And, and, uh, after four years of doing that shit, I was like, dude, I'm, I'm done with this. Like, I can't do it anymore. Like, you know, I spent fucking, you know, almost 25 years making everybody else rich. So. Yep. I had a guy that I interviewed. Um, I was going through a round of interviews to hire a project manager, and I still haven't yet. I started this process like four months ago. Um, but this guy was out of Arizona, and he, you know, with all these people, I'll do a phone interview first and then in person. Um, and through our phone interview, it's like, okay, you have a lot of experience with painting, project management. Um, he had run his own business for a while. Looks like he ditched that, went to work for another company for two years as a project manager there. Um, you know, so my question is like, hey, all right, what happened with your company? Why'd you stop doing it? Um, and then why are you leaving the last company that you're at? You know, why did that not work out? You know, what's the deal? Um, and the company that he was at most recently was a startup. And it was a, a guy who didn't really know much about painting. Um, but had a hundred grand to put into it and was bringing him on to kind of run things. You know, he had experience in running his own company. Um, so they were trying to blow this thing up. And so he just tried to dump money into it, you know, yeah. and like make it happen. Um, and they lasted about a year and then burned out because they couldn't keep the business going. They, they're having like bad reviews and yeah. uh, losing money on jobs and, you know, it did, just didn't last very long. They tried to hire a bunch of people, you know, so they had flaky people, people not showing up, jobs not getting finished on time, you know, and trying to save face by throwing more people at the job, you know, just to get it done, try to make a customer happy and just start losing money on everything. Yeah. I mean, I think there's kind of two, you know, there, there's a few different types when you look at that stuff. Like I'm aware of multiple businesses in, in my area that, are pretty fucking terrible, but they've been around for a while. And it's usually, it's usually those guys that, that are successful at throwing shit on a wall that, 
are the ones doing like the new commercial or the, the new fucking spec homes or whatever. And, yeah. you know, they, they're always, you know, this job pays for that job, yada, yada. Right. And, you know, they're just, the wheels are still spinning, man, but really they're, they're not, you know, the only work that they're getting is it's because these general contractors are looking at numbers and that's the only thing they're looking at. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a yeah, completely and you can kind of keep that going for a while. Yeah. It's a completely different animal. If you're, you know, if you're a service business and you are directly dealing with homeowners, you know, like I've, I've had to, I've had to, you know, watch my P's and Q's and kind of walk on eggshells and like learn how to deal with people because I come from a completely like new construction environment, dude. You know, I'm mm -hmm. used to being in subcontractor meetings and architect meetings, like arguing with people and shit and, yeah. you know, running a large crew and that I've kind of had to, you know, quit being Reel so, so socially retarded and actually <laughs> learn how to talk to people, you know? Yeah. <laughs> A lot of it in the repaint or residential work is talking to people. Yeah. A lot of it is like, you know, making sure they, that you sound intelligent to them. You sound yeah. like you know what you're doing. Even if you don't, you can fake a lot of it. Yeah. It's like, it's like learning cells. Uh, that's maybe mm -hmm. how some people can get shit spinning without experiences. You know, like maybe they're good at cells, maybe. Yeah. They're good at marketing, maybe, you know what I mean? That, that's yep. essentially, you essentially get a job by making somebody feel comfortable and how you talk to them and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I I just, that I started producing the videos just so I didn't have to talk to people. Yeah. You know? And I think. Yeah, that's a solid process too. I mean, that's. Yeah. By watching a short little video, it's like, oh, it looks like they do really good work. They care yeah. about quality, you know? That's kind of allowed me to, instead of like trying to sell somebody really hard on a higher price, I just don't give a shit anymore. And I, yeah. you know, I have enough videos now to where I can send, you know, a potential customer, a uh, copy and paste a, a link and send it with a bid packet. And I don't even really talk to them. Mm -hmm. If I get a call back, I get a call back. If I don't, whatever. And it kind of keeps me moving along. Um, I'm bidding a lot more jobs, getting less but mm -hmm. whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So we're in a different place. Well, I guess I'll address the the question first. <clears throat> Things that I would have done differently in the beginning um, is I would have tracked my numbers sooner. Um, so like my profit margins, my cost for doing projects. Now we have everything. Um, uh, we have production rates for everything. So my salesperson is not a painter, doesn't have any experience painting, um, but he can just go in and do measurements and sales, you know, and that's it. And his closing rate is like 35, 40% regularly with no follow-up. Um, and he just measures and talks to people, you know, and then he plugs his measurements into the system that I put together. And, uh, you know, we're able to be pretty consistently profitable um, but I would have started that process way earlier, um, if I can go back in time and then I would have hired myself out of a job faster too. I would have, um, probably made myself be project manager and then had someone else run the company, you know, brought in like a CEO basically to replace me. And then I would just be out in the field all day. I think that would have been a smart move early on. Now at this stage, I don't. I still don't have my business clean enough to where I can have a CEO come in and do my job. You know, I have quite a bit more organization to do uh, to make it clean enough to where someone else can run it. But that's the direction I'm heading in. Um, yeah. Some of the things that for me that I learned over time were being able to be detached from the company and not have everything be personal to me. Um, I did hire someone in 2015 who basically came on as like an operations guy and he was a tech person. Um, he had run, he had built maybe three or four companies, sold a couple, couple of them. Um, and, you know, he started out doing consulting for me uh, for about three or four months. You know, I was paying him like a hundred bucks an hour and he was helping me, 
uh, automate a lot of stuff, build our systems, um, build out our production rates so we could hire a salesperson. Uh, and then I hired him on full time and his salary was uh, $90,000 for the year. And um, he helped me do a lot. You know, I mean, we did a lot of the like basic stuff that all businesses should have, like an employee handbook and, you know, clocking in, clocking out, signing off time cards, uh, the whole payroll set up, you know, everything. Um, and throughout that whole, throughout that year, we had a lot of growth, you know, that was our first year with the salesperson. Plus I was also doing sales. Um, we're doing a lot of marketing, a lot of follow-up on our sales. And that was our biggest year in sales, but we lost money at the end of the year. Um, and we just had like losses everywhere. It was so messy. It was like half of our jobs we made money on, half of our jobs we lost money on. And like I was pulling my hair out, you know, trying to get all these jobs done, trying to be on time, like dealing with employees not showing up uh, or showing up late, leaving early, all that shit. It was a terrible year. It looked great. You know, like I, I remember, so I've gone to the PCA conference, the expo, um, I didn't go this last year, but I've gone, you know, three or four times and, um, and another conference as well. And these guys, so we did like a little over $3 million that year in sales. And, um, you know, so for other companies, it's like, whoa, that's a, you're a big company, you know, all that bullshit. And it's like, dude, like, yeah, sure. That's cool. But I, that was like my worst year in business. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like I lost my ass that year. What? Um, how many guys did you have? Uh, like thirty to thirty-five. Yeah. And man, it was. What just was your crazy. What was your weekly payroll averaging? <laughs> uh, I want to say it was like twenty-five grand. You know, like twenty-two thousand, something like that. Yeah. Um. And it was just crazy. It was, like the numbers were crazy. You know it. And it was hard to stop. So like I ran that for another year, um, maybe like 25 to 30 guys downsized a little bit. You know, I had two people in the office. Um, I let go of the, the tech guy after that first year. Um, and yeah, I mean, those two years were terrible. The year after that, I let go of everybody, not everybody, but cut everything in half. You know, got rid of my two office people, kept the salesperson, um, and cut my crew down to like 20, 22 guys. Yeah. And I had a good year, like a good solid year. You know, we were being a little more picky and choosy about the projects we did. Um, you know, we're doing, trying to keep 35 guys busy doing residential work. Like that's a shit ton of jobs. Yeah. You dude. know, cause and like some of those jobs are, out. yeah, some of those jobs are a thousand bucks. You know, yeah, and so a thousand dollar job, like I got to do like six of those plus, you know, seven or eight other full projects, you know, complete interior exteriors. Um, so it was a nightmare. Like it was just, and I would still have like, I don't know, a six hundred dollar job that we'd squeeze in here and there, you know. But I can't have a low a low guy on the totem pole do a six hundred dollar job because if he goes and does it and fucks it up. Then I got to send one of my good guys to go fix it, you know. And now that six hundred dollar job that was going to cost me a hundred, now it cost me three hundred. Now I didn't make any money on that job. Plus, I took away from my next job. Like it was a nightmare. <laughs> um, so, but early on, like I, I haven't managed the business really well uh, until very recently. You know, probably like the last three, three or four years. Um, have been very stable and, you know, good income, steady, steady money coming in, steady work, good profits. Um, but prior to that, so my growth from like 500,000 to like 800,000, I was making good money in that range. It was pretty stress-free. Um, it was me and like, you know, six or seven other guys, something like that. So I knew everybody pretty closely. Uh, I worked on 
half of the projects and we did really good work, like really high quality, clean, not many mistakes and made good money. As soon as we started pushing over the million dollar mark, like I couldn't be on jobs very much. That's when the beginning of having to let go of quality started happening. You know, I couldn't, there was no way I could keep the type of quality that I'd become accustomed to while growing that big. There was just no way to do it. You know, it was like a losing battle. Yeah. So I had to put together processes that could keep us at least in like the 85% range, you know, like every now and then I would get to 95% on my quality. Um, but 85% was what I was building everything for, you know? So if everything could be 85% good, then it was successful. So, and I think that's the case for most businesses. Like, you know, I don't know, a shoe cobbler, like if you go to a massive franchised shoe cobbling place, like they're not going to be as good as that one dude on the corner who's been doing it for 30 years, who only does it himself or he's teaching his son, you know, yeah. like that's the guy to go to, right? Cause he's like expert level knows all the tricks of the trade, but the franchise shoe cobbler is like cutting yeah. corners and they're just aiming for reviews and, you know, um, but that was the same for us. It was like, I, I built a good reputation, you know, cause I'd been in business for a long time and did really good quality work. And so we had a lot of good repeat business and, uh, but then, you know, it was impossible to keep, keep everything at that high of a level to grow that big and keep it at that high of a level. Yeah. So, but from the beginning, yeah, it would have been tracking my numbers. Um, just all the time. I would have so much data if I had started tracking it that early on. At this point now, I have maybe like six or seven years of good data, which is, you know, plenty. I mean, that's definitely good enough for me to to use to improve the company and all that. But it could have happened earlier. You know, I could have made better decisions earlier if I'd been tracking my numbers. My cost for like actual cost for doing projects, um, my actual materials cost, my actual payroll, my employer taxes, all that stuff. There's a lot See, of I expenses in there. I don't look at any of that shit, dude. Like, you know, I, I just, I bid and I bid and I, I get what I get and I am understaffed and overworked. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And yeah. I just, you know, I've kind of built this fucking machine that I don't really know how to drive. You know what I mean? Yeah. In, in terms of the business, but not, you know, not the field stuff. The field stuff is the easy part for me. And but, I think that's the majority of companies these days. The, the majority of, of like painters turn business owner is that's how it was for me. It was like the whole five to 10 years, first five to 10 years was like just a steamroller. Like I can't stop working because I got to make, I got to cover my payroll, right? Whoever I have working with me. Um, I'm not charging enough to have a big savings or anything. So I'm like pretty much paycheck to paycheck. Um, and there was, never felt like there was any time to like be in the office for a, one day a week. You know, it's like yeah. I had fires to put out. I had shit to get done so I can collect checks. Yeah. And that's, I mean, when you, you kind of talked to me about doing this, that was, you know, what I kind of had in the back of my head was like, you know, if there's anybody that, you know, I could meet on, you know, on the fucking internet that, you know, <laughs> I could learn something from in terms of business, it's, it's somebody like you. But, uh, you know, I was at, I think, you know, running and directing field operations for the last business I worked for, we were at about four point or 1.4 million. And I had an average of five to seven guys. Mm -hmm. And dude, that was just balls to the wall, fucking yeah. nonstop. And I have no idea, you know, like I had my fingers a little bit in, you know, like writing up an extra ticket or fucking, you know, I, I was pretty much running the entire business except for, um, you know, fucking writing up bids and stuff. And my boss had an estimator. He also had a, a framing crew and, you know, I had, uh, the framing crew when I started was well over, you know, doing what the, the painting crew would do and drywall and all that shit. And, um, after the second year I started surpassing their cells and stuff, but, yeah. um, and 
I don't know, man. Like I didn't get to sit down and look at all that shit. Like no company that I worked for, I didn't get to sit down and, and comprehend how the business worked. I was just always the guy in the field training guys and, and running the jobs. So, um, you know, like that's, that's where I lack due to business, but it's been fun learning it. Like I, I love learning everything about it except for the fucking taxes. <laughs> yeah. So the <laughs> trick for me with taxes, which I, I haven't been crystal or squeaky clean on it. I've had some tax issues where I owed money. I had to set up payments and all that shit. I got levy notices, you know, from the IRS. I think I um, owe $12,000 from last year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I've been through that, all that shit too. You know, it's like yeah. I've had lawsuits filed against me. I've had IRS debt that I've had to resolve. Um, I've been through a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, you come out of it on the other side. It's not going to kill you. Uh, it makes things stressful, but. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, we had talked about it and that the giving some insight on like what my business operations look like on the day to day, um, the information that I track, the, the way that I manage my finances, you know, so I, I know when I'm going to run out of money, how to prevent running out of money, um, all that stuff. Those are things that we're going to do also with, as part of this podcast or this whole deal is, you know, do some episodes or YouTube or live stuff on what my processes look like, what my systems look like. Cause I'm not, I still do hands-on work sometimes. Um, like all this alder in my shop, I'm going to do some work on that. I've got to have it out by Saturday. And I like dicking around with that stuff. You know? Yeah. So I'll do some but, work here. But, but you know, you have to be honest, like the only reason you're doing that is because like it's like a throwback or whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, like the good old days. <laughs> yeah, and I think guys like you like do shit like that because you know, like you're not, you know, you fucking can't paint anymore. You not know what dead I mean? Yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can't paint anymore technically because you have to, you have to run head of of all this yeah. shit that you've built. So, yeah, it is fun. Like, uh, it's fun for me to paint now. Right. Yeah. Like it wasn't when I had to all the time. I didn't, I, I enjoyed some things, but I mean, now almost anything is enjoyable to me. Like fucking, if I got to go help the guys caulk baseboards and patch nail holes all day, like I find some joy in it, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's also a place for me to like quiet my mind and just only think about what I'm doing or, or just let my mind wander, you know, like aimlessly, patch nail holes for four hours straight, you know, and just my mind just goes out. Yeah. Does whatever. Yeah, I'm not I couldn't, about business. I couldn't have an office job or anything like that. So, yeah, you know, fucking, I couldn't do it. Yeah. Even, even, you know, that, I mean, and that's essentially what this is going to turn into for me eventually, mm -hmm. you know, once I can't be in the field anymore, but, um, or once I don't want to be in the field, but mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, it, that's the thing though, is like, I, that's why it's essential to, I think, to have experience to do this shit, man. Yeah. You know, you have to, you have to have some level of passion for it. And, um, it's like our, you know, we had an estimator in, in our office, you know, uh, when I worked for the last commercial company and dude, that guy fucked me so many times. Like. <laughs> I had yeah. one bus transfer station we were doing where he missed like eight thousand dollars in anti graffiti coatings. Who the <laughs> fuck do you think? You know Get who it. does that fall on? Where I yep. have to now? I've got to make up eight thousand dollars worth of work. You know what yep. I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I don't look at. You know, I've had uh, guys like you know paint reps and shit that aren't paint reps anymore. Like reach out to me and be like, "Hey man, if you need an estimator, like." you know, I'll work off a percentage. And I thought about it, but I was like, dude, that dude doesn't know my systems. He doesn't know what we're capable of. And, it, yeah. you know, sure, you could go measure a house and write up a number that I tell you, but you can't go field assess a fucking yeah. repaint. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, doing what you're doing and having a, a system for that is, is pretty fucking valuable because you're not just 
crunching a number. Like I would never trust somebody to go, to go bid a repaint for me, you know, or yeah. a restoration or whatever. So, I mean, that I'm sure that's taken a lot of time to have a system for. Yeah. And that's the bottleneck for most people, right? Is it's like, because you wouldn't trust somebody to go do that for you. Um, most people are in that same boat, you know, like they couldn't imagine somebody with no painting experience going and selling a job. It's like, even for me, like when I first started having this guy do sales, it's like, fuck, what's going to happen? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How is this next month going to go? You know, um, it was overwhelming, but it was also like, well, let's, you know, what's the worst that could happen? You know, like he sells jobs too cheap. Well, I get final say, I get to review the photos. I get to review the measurements. I get to ask questions, you know, before I click the send button on the estimate, you know? Um, so there's some checks and balances in there. And then it was like tracking his numbers. All right. You know, he's closing like 30, 35% in the beginning. Um, that's good enough to keep his job. You know, it's definitely not as high as my closing rates were, but this, like the whole thing of growing is you kind of have to expect less. <laughs> like yeah. you can't have as high of expectations. Like, you know, I don't think anybody, well, there are some people that will do things better than you. Like, I think somebody can manage my business better than I do. Um, I don't think there are many people that would do better sales for my company than I would. Um, you know, that would probably be if, if, if I brought a CEO in and said, Hey, whatever job you think I'm best at or best for put me in that position and I'll do it. Um, it would either be sales or training, you know, one of those two, that that's where I would best suit my business. It would not be in running the company. Somebody could run the company way better than I can. Um, but so like the transition from working all the time to becoming the boss and leaving responsible ones in charge, like you have to let go of some of the quality. It's just going to happen. You know, you have to accept that there's going to be some mistakes sometimes. So for me, like to, to let go of that stuff and be really comfortable in allowing mistakes to happen, allowing like dumb fuck ups to happen, you know, where like the guys painted the room, the wrong color, you know, it's like, we have a, you know, client calls me and says, I gave you guys all the colors. Did, did you not tell the guys that are here at the house to paint my bedroom blue? You know, it's like, fuck, <laughs> like, yes, I did tell them to paint the bedroom blue. <laughs> you know, it's like a, a stupid mistake, right? Yeah. And it's embarrassing to me, you know, but I'm honest with the client. Um, you know, I'll tell them like, hey, look, we have a, a, a spreadsheet that has all the colors where they go on it. You know, this is embarrassing. I'm sorry. You know, if this puts you out, I'll make sure we take care of it tomorrow. You know, I'm confident that um, I know that that we'll take care of the client. Like no matter what the issue is, we'll do the right thing always. Um, and I could sleep well knowing that, right? Like I know I'm not out to try to screw people. I'm not trying to get one over on anybody. If there's any issue in question on, on who should be at fault, I'll likely take the blame you know, like I treat my customers really well. I treat my employees really well. So Did accepting see, that there's going to be problems, yeah. I'm okay with that because I know I'll do the right thing. I know we as a company will do the right thing. So, yeah, we fuck up sometimes, but we always fix it. See, I'm not, I'm not in that position. So I am, you know, I'm in the field every day. Um, I will, I'll get up early. I'll go to work. Um, I'll get phone calls during the day. I'll schedule my estimates, you know, after five and then I'll take paperwork home and sometimes do it until 12, one o'clock in the morning, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and that's, that's just kind of where I'm at. And mm -hmm. the reason I'm there is because I don't, you know, I don't want to fuck with hiring people like coming off of my background of, you know, just training guys all day, every day, like, um, I didn't, uh, I didn't give anyone fucking slack when I ran logistics, dude. Like I started people on the ground and in the closets, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. everyone started out with a fucking ball of putty and a sanding pad and, you know, you had to earn the next step. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've had to simmer down a lot for myself and, you know, the market's changing, fucking people's mentalities are changing. Everyone's butt hurt now. And, you know, everyone wants more than what's deserved. So 
I'm just, uh, I'm kind of waiting it out. Going to see how, how it goes. I'm going to have to put on a couple of guys this year possibly, but, um, for the time being, I haven't, I haven't wanted to fuck with it. So, you know, transitioning from working all the time to becoming the boss and leaving responsible ones in charge. That's, that's not me yet. Yeah. You know, and it never, it never was me, but you know, that's, that was my, you know, responsibility was my job when, you know, my bosses were in the office doing that shit. Right. So you were the one that they left in charge. You were the responsible yeah. one that they left in charge of the projects. Yeah, so, so you just need to find a you. Maybe, maybe that could be an answer for a dude is to find either a good field supervisor or find somebody a step above that to direct all your field operations. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean that. Yeah. So at this point now, the way that I run my company is I have four men who run the on-site day to day, you know, so in the beginning of the week, um, I'll usually have my salesperson or I'll go out as well and we'll kind of get the project started. You know, we'll be there on day one or day two, kind of do a walkthrough with the guys in case they have any questions about anything. Um, and then never go back, you know, and the rest is done phone calls or on the computer through email. Um, and a lot of the projects, I mean, I would say these days probably like 75% of my projects I never see in person. You know, I don't go do the bid. Um, I don't get them started. I don't do a final walkthrough. I don't do any of that. I see pictures, you know, that my estimator takes. Um, and we turn out good work. You know, we're most of the projects are, um, like our main goal is durability. You know, we want, no matter what, we want everything to be durable. Um, but like on interiors, we want nice, clean work. But we're not uh, sanding every little nib down. You know, like if you go through my walls on an interior project, you'll find some imperfections, I'm sure. Um, shouldn't find anything obvious, but uh, we get clients every now and then where they're really nitpicky and, you know, we'll please them and spend all the time going through all the tiny little nibs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, even with, I don't know, I think that's probably, you know, having somebody or guys that take care of that sh shit for you while you're in mm -hmm. the position that you're in is probably essential. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of, you know, the way I came up, I went through so many different processes and learn so many different ways of doing things that, you know, my knowledge is kind of a combination of all the things that work best, you know, mm -hmm. and then I've got some of my own personal touch on the shit, but process is a huge thing. And if you erect, like if you're doing new construction or whatever, if you erect your process out of everything that works and get, you know, you get rid of the shit that doesn't, because, you know, mm -hmm. honestly, one of the, you know, the biggest things that painters do is think they're going to reinvent the wheel and yeah. just, you know, all they're doing is sitting there fucking spinning their wheels in the mud, dude, not moving forward. But yep. even on our production projects, man, you know, I had it to a science to where we would walk out and there would be no self-induced punch out. You know what I mean? Um, so, yep. you know, accepting less than perfect. Yes, that's, you know, you probably got to do that if you're looking this guy's obviously looking to transition out of the field but um i have no idea he didn't specifically describe how many guys he has or if he has right. any or whatever you know but mm -hmm. you know hopefully we've touched on some of the things that uh he wanted to hear and then the last one accepting people may take advantage of you yes so i've got um employees that will show up late that will leave early that might not even run it by me. Um, I just find out, you know, I don't know. My foreman might tell me on Friday, like if I'm on his ass about, Hey, how are we not done with this project yet? You know, like you had all week on this thing. This should have been done by Wednesday. This should have been done by Thursday. They should have been done today. Today should have been an easy day. Right? Like, and you're not even finished. What's going on? And then it comes out, oh, well, this guy left early on Wednesday, um, and then he showed up late on Thursday. You know, they're not forthcoming with the information. Nobody wants to tell on anyone else, you know, all that bullshit. Um, but, you know, then it's like, all right, well, now I'm going to call that guy. Hey, you left early on Wednesday. 
how come you didn't text me? How come you didn't let me know? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. Like, yeah, whatever. Um, but like, if you want to grow, you can't fire those people all the time. Like when I was starting yeah. out, I would have fired that guy. Right. Yeah. Like you left early on Wednesday. You didn't call me. Oh, I forgot. Like, come on, dude. You forgot. Like, you think I'm stupid. <laughs> yeah. You didn't think, you know, if I leave at two o'clock instead of four 30, uh, that maybe I should give someone a heads up or maybe that's not okay. Um, so, and I know that stuff slips through the cracks sometimes, you know, I'm sure like if I could look at my bill at the end of the year of how much money I spent on people that weren't actually there on the job site, it's probably make me sick. Yeah. Uh, but it's part of it, you know, yeah. like I, it's going to happen. I, I have clients that do the same thing, right? Clients will tell my guys, cause I'm not there, you know, and they'll say, Oh, this, this door was supposed to be included. You know, uh, I talked to Dane, the estimator about it. He said, you guys would paint it. So my guys will just paint it. They think they're doing the right thing, you know? Yeah. And talk to my foreman. It's like, oh yeah, we painted the other doors too. Cause they said they were supposed to be in there. And it's like, what the fuck? They're not supposed to be in there. We got to charge them for it. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's like 600 bucks in a half a day. You know, and it's like, fuck. Yeah. call the client. Hey, I, we didn't bill you for these doors, blah, blah, blah. Right. But that, that happens a lot too. You know, and my guys think they're doing the right thing by like, oh, well, we must have missed it on the notes. And so I'll go ahead and take care of it. You know, don't worry about it, client. We'll take care of it. Yeah. Uh, and that's on um, both ends happens. Yeah. I, dude, I've got a, I, I mean, I've got so many fucked up stories that I probably shouldn't tell, but, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, man, The accepting people may take advantage of you. You know, like, like I said, my, my perspective was coming from, you know, that of a director of field operations. So, um, dude, you know, it was always my job to, to be in meetings and watch our backs. And, you know, uh, dude, if, if we piss somebody off, you know, you could come to the job the next morning and, a the fucking carpenters threw their trim package up on your raw walls because you pissed them off or something or, yeah. you know what I mean? Or flip it around and you have, uh, you know, fire hardware and shit that, uh, you were supposed to leave off a fucking door yeah. or, or that you were, <laughs> that you were supposed to have a door painted prior to having, you know, uh, self-closing fire doors and stuff like that automated, Yep. And I, I've been instructed before, like on a, you know, on a school to get there at like 4 a.m. and put fucking alkyd enamel on those doors so they're wet. <laughs> and when those guys get there to install that shit, they're going to be pissed. And, yeah. uh, you know, and just like watching supers running around kicking buckets all over the walls and shit because they're so <laughs> pissed off. But, yeah. dude, it's a, uh, you know, it's a different game when you're you're in business for yourself strictly dealing with homeowners. So, yeah. um, you know, we're used to just balls to the wall, you know, fighting with subs and, mm -hmm. and just making shit happen all day, every day. And it's a totally different story now. So like with me, um, like you look at like a guy that I've had a couple guys work for me for my business that I pulled, you know, they have worked for me for other businesses in the past when I mm. ran lead and I never gave anybody a fucking inch, dude. And that was yeah. what kept people in check, dude. What kept me in check, you know, like, uh, technically like my bosses never told me what to do. Like I, I made shit happen and I always had a carrot dangled in front of me thinking, you know, I'm going to get a bonus or I'm going to get this or I'm going to get that. And that's what mm. kind of, kept things going and it, you know, usually just ended in fucking broken promises and stuff. And mm -hmm. the one thing I would get to take with me when I had fucking enough of it was the fact that they'd never have something like that again. So, yeah. um, dude, like, you know, I had one guy that I brought over and I put him through the fucking ringer working for other people, dude, just drag him <laughs> through the mud. And that was what kept him fucking going, dude. Yeah. And when I brought him to my business and, you know, ran them for a year and a half or so. And I was nice and I didn't push and yada, yada. And he fucking fell apart, dude. 
he yeah. took advantage of the fact that I was being nice and, yeah. you know, giving him more money than he'd ever made and giving him bonuses, giving him more fucking bonuses than I got when I was running lead and shit. And, uh, yeah. he just fucking fell apart, dude. So I personally mm -hmm. don't know that balance. Um, Right now, you know, like I said, it's just me and my brother, and I'm not going to play that game right now. Um, there's not very many guys in our market. Um, you know, in the 90s, fucking guys were expendable, dude. You fire yeah. motherfuckers every day because there'd just be another one lined up waiting yep. to go to work. You know, hit 08, shit started to creep off, and then, mm -hmm. you know, the guys that were in the field, man, were like the go-getters, and... Um, you know, like 2008 to like 2012 and shit. Like it was just scragglers, man. A lot of the companies shut down. A lot of the guys got out of the trade and, you know, you fast forward a little bit and a lot of people in the field, you know, after the financial collapse, man, like handyman types that got into it. And just once yeah. the work was flowing again, man, it pulled in all this inexperience because there was no experience to fill that fucking void in the market. Yeah. And now, dude, those people that kind of came in with that experience are training new guys that don't know what the fuck they're doing. And I, mm -hmm. I don't know how it is across the rest of the country, dude, but my area is fucked. Like, <laughs> I can't. I've had a now hiring ad in the paint store for like three years now, dude. And I think I've <laughs> yeah. had one person call it. And that's probably my fault or whatever because it says uh, – what does it say? It says something stupid like must have or uh, must be capable of passing OSHA 10 – um, must have a vehicle, blah, blah, blah. Then it says, uh, no drugs, no alcohol, no bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> no no drugs and it. alcohol is a big one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I guess we'll wrap this up, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, the main points for me is I would have tracked my numbers earlier. Um, I personally would have hired somebody to run my company earlier on. I think that would have been a big, good move. I don't know how you find someone like that, though. I mean, even yeah. now, for me to find somebody to run my company and to trust that they're going to build it and grow it the right way would be hard. But for sure, 100%, without a doubt, there are people that can run my company better than me. Um, and then the transition, uh, I mean, there are responsible people out there. You know, like you could might have been able to be hired by another company. You know, if another company was like, hey, don't go work for yourself, come work for me, I'll pay you $85,000 a year. You know, it's like, all right, well, I'll consider that. Right. So there are good people out there. You might have to pay for them. Yeah. Um, but like, I have a couple of guys that are legit, you know, like really hard workers and they know how to troubleshoot everything. And internally, they're hard workers, right? Like internally, they hold themselves accountable. I don't have to be a dick to them. I don't have to be on their ass every day. They know what needs to be done. They know how to do it really fast. They know how to do it really slow. They know how to do it really perfect. Um, and they know when each one is called for, you know, like they're smart, they're thinkers, right? They're not just there to fucking brush all day and roll all day. They think about the project. Um, but I've only I had, had a, a couple of them. I had a guy cut like that seen my shit on Instagram. Like this was, uh, had to have been at least a couple years ago, but he fucking called me and offered offered me to to fly me out to Southern California. Mm -hmm. Said he said he'd give me a hundred grand a year to help him fire some shit off. Yeah, and I was like, I thought I was like, well, that's that's pretty good, but yeah, fuck that, you know. Yeah, and I just kind of went full board in, into what I'm doing, but yeah, you know, the upside is so big if you could run your own company and do it well, like. I mean, for me, I've always loved being able to make my own schedule, you know, like right now um, I've got kids sports six days a week, you know, and I'm there at all the practices at four o'clock, five o'clock, um, you know, like if I have shit to do, like nowadays is different than it was five years ago or eight years ago, but eight years ago, if I had to take a couple of days off because I had to get some other shit done or go visit family or whatever, it was not a big deal. You know, like it was no problem at all. I didn't have to check with someone. I didn't, maybe I had to call a client and say, Hey, I need to push you back. But, um, that's the only thing working for someone else is like, you just, you have a boss now, you know, and you have to get your life and your schedule approved by someone else. Um, that's just never, 
that's always been a problem to me. You know, I try to kind of treat my guys differently, but they still have to approve it with me. You know, they can't just up and leave. I'm pretty darn flexible when it comes to that stuff, but I do need a little bit of notice usually, you know, yeah. but all right. Yeah. I think that's about it. I, we could probably talk for hours about these topics, but yeah, uh, maybe we'll take deeper dives on more specific parts of this. Um, yep. In the future. Right, right in with your questions. Yeah. Send them in. As always, please like our YouTube page. Give us five-star only reviews on all podcast platforms. If you have questions or comments, send them over to hello at paintsniffers.com or on Instagram at paint underscore sniffers. You can also watch the video version of the podcast on the Alpha Painting YouTube page. Go to playlists and it will be filed under Paint Sniffer Podcast. Via YouTube, you can write into qa at paintsniffer.com. Thank you for listening to Paint Sniffer Podcast.